Uh, good morning. Uh, this is the regularly scheduled Transportation and Public Works Committee. Uh, this day, May 17, 2016. I'm Councilman Reich. I'll be chairing the committee. I'm joined by my colleagues on the committee, uh, including Council President, Vice President uh, Glidden, Council Members uh, Palmasano, Bender, and Gordon. We are a quorum. Councilman Yang is out ill today and will not be joining us. Um, we have several items on the agenda, 12 in total, or actually 18 in total, several of which are on the consent. I'll go through those. Any committee member can pull them if they wish for further consideration. Uh, item two is the 2016 Protected Bikeways Program, layout approvals. Uh, and these are approvals for the streets listed 11th Avenue South, West River Parkway to 6th, Blaisdell Avenue South, 29th Street West to 40th Street West, and Franklin Avenue East to 29th Avenue South to Seabury Avenue. Item three is the Godfrey Parkway Bridge Replacement Layout Approval. Uh, that's a resolution approving that, that project. Uh, item four is the contract with Lindale Neighborhood Association for Graffiti Prevention Project. Uh, item five is the agreement with Hennepin County uh, for traffic signal system renovation project. Item six is an agreement with the Shingle Creek Watershed Management Commission for Cleveland Neighborhood Association Private Stormwater Management Practices, a series of actions for that. Item seven is agreement with the Metropolitan Council for Bus Shelters on Nicollet Mall. Item eight is the agreement with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board for stormwater pump station easements. Item nine is the Washington Avenue Reconstruction Project Cooperative Agreement with Hennepin County. And that's executing that agreement with them uh, for that project uh, for the distance listed. Item 10 is the contract amendment with Minger Construction Company Incorporated for the Hennepin Lindale Sanitary Sewer Improvement Project. And item 11 is the grant for Mississippi Watershed Management Organization for the 24th Avenue Southeast Infiltration Project. Item 12 um, is the donation of the Minneapolis Downtown Council for P PV Plaza Plantings. And that's a value at approximately $15,000. Item uh, 13 is the water service line repair assessment cancellation for a specific address, the amount listed. Item 14 is the 2017-2020 public works consulting pool. Um, item 15 is the bid for metal seated gate valve. Um, 16 is the bid for lime sludge holding tank repair. Item 17 is the bid for the grit chamber. Um, and that's from the low bid for contact engineered solutions for the amount listed. And that is all the consent items. Does anyone wish to pull any of those items? See none, all in approval say aye. 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 Dissenting nay. That carries. We can now go to the top of the agenda, which is a presentation, 2016 National Public Works Week. Good morning, Director Kaki. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, we, we have a resolution. I, I think you are going to read the resolution, but uh, this is National Public Works Week. It's, a, it's something that happens annually where we recognize the uh, really the employees of public works for the services that they provide the city. Thank you. And yes, the resolution reads uh, as follows. And this is a resolution of the city of Minneapolis by all council members. And it's declaring the week of May 15, 2016 as National Public Works Week. Whereas the American Public Works Association will celebrate the 56th annual National Public Works Week, which will be held the third week in May with the theme Public Works Always There. And whereas the National Public Works Week is the celebration of the men and women who play a crucial role and are dedicated to in strengthening our community, designing, maintaining infrastructure, and improving our quality of life. And whereas public works services provided in the community are an integral part of the citizens' everyday lives, and whereas the department's thousand plus employees know that Minneapolis depends on public works and the men and women of the profession are always there and always ready and whereas the support and understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operational public work systems and programs such as water sewer streets and solid waste collection and whereas the health safety and comfort of the community greatly depends on these facilities and services and whereas the quality of the effectiveness of these facilities, as well as their planning, design, construction, are vitally dependent on the efforts and skill of public works officials, and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff the public works department is materially influenced by the people's attitudes and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Minneapolis acknowledges the significant daily contributions that employees within the Public Works Department in the City of Minneapolis provide to citizens and businesses throughout the city during National Public Works Week. Thank you for all you do. Yes, any action with the clerk beyond just the submittal? That's a resolution? Okay, so we have a resolution before us. Um, any further discussion? All in favor of the resolution as stated, say aye. 
Aye. Uh, dissenting, nay, that carries. We are thereby resolved. Now going to the last item, uh, which is a discussion of some significant work that's been done. Uh, Minneapolis Complete Streets Policy. Director Kaki. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, uh, so I'm quite excited that we are finally bringing <laughs> to your committee the uh, uh, Complete Streets Policy for adoption. And I have uh, Nathan Coster from our Transportation Planning and Programming that will make the presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Nathan Coster, Supervisor, Transportation Planner, Public Works Department, Transportation Planning and Programming. And I have a brief presentation this morning on the Complete Streets Policy. We will be looking to adopt the Complete Streets Policy for its inclusion as a companion item to Access Minneapolis, the city's transportation plan. So this morning my presentation will cover what is Complete Streets, what is the Complete Streets Policy, give an overview of some of the stakeholder and advisory committee outreach performed as a part of this policy development, cover some of the policy development items and the themes of the policy, give a brief overview of some of the research and guidance and best practices that went into making this policy, and cover some of the framework and key policy elements that I'd like to bring to the attention today. So what are complete streets? I provide a few images here, and what I'd really like to call out, though, is although we show a number of images of what people may think of complete streets or what comes to mind, is there's no prescriptive design which is all-inclusive of complete streets. What we really focused on with this policy is a decision-making tool that is very much process-driven and based in the context of the local environments that are present within the city of Minneapolis. So what is the Complete Streets Policy? It's really a focus on a commitment to building a complete and integrated public right-of-way. I'd really like to reestablish that. It's looking at the whole public right-of-way instead of just the streets itself. And it's ensuring that everyone, all users, are able to safely and comfortably use the street, whether they're walking, biking, taking transit, or driving a motorized vehicle. And as I mentioned, this is all users, regardless of age, ability, income, socioeconomic background, gender, or culture. And the key theme is this is very much a process going from programming, planning, construction, design, operation, and maintenance. More looking at a chronological approach throughout the inception of projects, all the way through the construction, operation, and maintenance. So some of the backgrounds of what is Complete Streets Policy, why is the city bringing forth a Complete Streets Policy? I would say over the last five to ten years, this is a very much a policy movement that has grown both on a local scale. There's a number of local cities in Minnesota that have passed a Complete Streets Policy, a lot of counties and uh, regional agencies, and this is something that we are looking to bring forward today. There is a lot of growing support both on the federal level as well. The, recently, the U.S. Surgeon General called the call to action supporting complete streets, promoting a step up, uh, step it up plan, which promotes walkable communities and walkable communities designs. And most recently, the Federal Transportation Act, the FAST Act, which is the first multi-year transportation bill, specifically called out elements of complete streets to facilitate much more multimodal designs in the roadways. And what I'd really like to call the attention as well is this very much plan that's consistent with and aligning with a lot of the adopted city plans we already have in place. Some of the examples I have, Access Minneapolis, it's very much integrated. There are elements of complete streets, even references to complete streets approaches to street and sidewalk design guides, and the city's comprehensive plan, Minneapolis plan. Also other plans I'd like to call attention to, the Climate Action Plan and an upcoming uh, effort that the city's been working on is the Downtown Public Realm Framework Plan. So as far as the involvement we've had to date, we've had quite a bit of outreach with both uh, policymakers, a stakeholder group, and a number of advisory committees, all providing elements for input throughout the development of the process, uh, the policy. This has been an ongoing effort for a little over a year in this most recent iteration of looking at the Complete Streets policy. And we've been having a number of meetings both uh, internally with staff and externally with our stakeholders throughout this to gather input at key phases. As far as who these stakeholder groups are and what their role was, 
is they were actively involved in the development of the policy and they represented a wide range of user groups and travel modes and they attended a series of meetings over the past year as I had mentioned to really help staff generate a, a clear direction and content and where we want to see this policy going and really providing uh, really good input to really make the policy as best as it can be. Uh, as far as the stakeholders that were active throughout, as I mentioned, this rep group represented bicyclists, pedestrians, transit users, students, people with disabilities. Uh, we engaged a number of people on the committees with uh, advisory committee on aging. And, and at one point, the, uh, the access and outreach committee reaching out to communities of uh, typically underrepresented populations. Other groups involved were other transportation agencies. Hennepin County was a very good resource having passed the Complete Streets policy back in 2009, provided a lot of lessons learned. Similarly with MnDOT, uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation, having recently passed the policy as well. Very good resources uh, to provide us local transportation agencies to give us context and guidance on how they had recently had successes adopting Complete Streets policy. As far as city staff, uh, there are a number of people represented from Public Works, myself included, as well as uh, the Health Department, Community Planning and Economic Development, and the, uh, excuse me, the Neighborhood and Community uh, Relations Department. I'll briefly cover some of the key themes, goals, and outcomes of the policy. Is they really want, the, the thoughts was to really initiate change, making sure we're tracking all the modes when we're looking at projects, not just motor vehicles, but pedestrians and bicyclists, making sure we're making, this is a very context sensitive approach, looking at all users and making sure we're incorporating innovative designs or approaches for projects. The goals being that we would rebalance our investments such that there are investments for all users and modes, making sure there is specific consideration for green infrastructure and focusing on proving those transparency and roles throughout project development and equitable engagement when we do the community outreach process. As far as the policy development, we saw a number of guidance and examples, uh, both nationally and locally. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, resources available, and it was uh, utilized to the fullest ex extent possible throughout the development of the policy. We conducted a number of peer city reviews looking at very much leading policy and attended a number of local trainings and webinars to really get our hands around what it means to be a complete streets policy, key elements and how we make it uh, transition that into an implement the implementation phases. So what does the policy contain? It contains the policy statement, uh, the purpose and vision, what does the city want to look like in the future? And then the policy framework, which really focuses on what I'll cover in the next slide, which is the modal priority framework. And then, as I said, implementation, following a chronological order from programming, planning, design, construction, operation, and maintenance. And then lastly, it outlines the exemptions. What I should, uh, what is one of the key themes of this policy is not many policies throughout the country have something like this, but it's called the modal priority framework. And this is a modal priority framework that prioritizes the modes in the order of pedestrians, then bicycles and trans transit uh, on the same level, vice versa. It could be transit or bicycles, bicycles or transit, followed by motor vehicles. And this is very much aligns with the adopted city plan and is very much context sensitive, aligning with all the Access Minneapolis components, such as the citywide action plan, the downtown action plan, pedestrian, bicycle master plan, and the street and sidewalk design guidelines. And as I said, it's very much a context sensitive approach by doing this modal hierarchy. This is not implying that there's bike lanes on every street or there's going to be transit on every street. It is very much ingrained in the current plans and approaches that we do have and allows it to update as those plans are updated. Some of the key themes of the policy is, as I mentioned, the modal priority framework which will inform the transportation-related decision-making process. And all transportation projects are subject to the process laid forth by the policy. And as I mentioned, it is a process. No projects are exempt from the process, so all projects will go through the Complete Streets policy. And a tracking and implementation tool with the Complete Streets project delivery checklist. 
following through on certain elements of the policy and tracking that to improve the transparency in roles. And as I mentioned, this applies to all transportation projects, both public projects and private projects that do impact and relate to the public realm. The city's, the city's public right-of-way is our largest resources, and as such, having a complete streets policy that does control that process is a very important component because there are a lot of uh, private developments that go into and impact or influence the public right-of-way. Lastly, one of the key elements of the complete streets policy is the exemptions process. No project is exempt from the process of complete streets. However, exemptions will be requested if certain modal elements have been documented in modal plans, but they are not included as a part of the final project. And there's a number of criteria that are laid forth which uh, uh, merit that request for an exemption, such as if a, a bike improvement is not included where one is identified, that would require an exemption from the City Council. And with that, that concludes my presentation. I'll stand by if there's any questions, comments, or discussion. Um, any questions or comments per the uh, presentation? Must have been a thorough presentation. <laughs> See none. Um, do we have um, oh, any other comments from the department uh, in terms of the work being done? Well, then I will. So, Councilmember Bender, Councilmember Gordon Bender. Well, um, you could move it if you want to. I just wanted to thank everybody for their work on it. This is actually um, very exciting to see this coming forward. I think we landed in a really good place too with our with the policy here, and it sets us up for the future. This is actually a priority of mine this year that I thought about was getting our complete streets um, policy done. I um, was was also very hopeful that this would be part of Director Kotke's legacy that he could leave behind. And, and we, for a while there, I wasn't sure we'd get it completed in time, but we have, and I think that's just fantastic. I really appreciate the, the patience and flexibility of staff and the steering group that um, I served on with others here and um, the Bicycle Advisory Committee, Pedestrian Advisory Committee, all the stakeholders who got involved um, to, to get us to this point here. And I feel really good about it and I'm enthusiastic about um, supporting this and then working hard to keep an eye on it and implement it as best we can. Councilmember Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm really excited that we've come to this moment. This has been actually years in the making. This is the second iteration of a complete streets policy um, that predates my time on the council. And then we've been working on this for probably a year and a half or so. Um, and the amount, I mean, when you see the list of stakeholders, it's impressive, but when you kind of dig into how much time you, Nathan, spent and other staff with each of those stakeholder groups, it's just really a lot of work went into this policy. Um, you know, this is something that's four pages long, uh, which I think is a strength. You know, we've really condensed um, what I think is a transformative vision for how we approach our right of way in the city uh, into a very concise um, policy which, as you said, um, really reinforces where we're going, but I think takes it to the next level and just like really restates and reinforces it. I'm really excited about some of the implementation tools that we wove into the plan, in particular, the checklist that um, staff has been working on um, that will look at how um, it's this project delivery checklist. Uh, so every time a project comes forward, this will ask questions about which modes are appropriate for this road. If something is on the bike plan, um, how are we going to incorporate a bike facility? And if not, what is our alternative options, just as one example? Um, and so I think that that's the part where this is really going to get ingrained into the method of, of street design. There were a few other implementation pieces that um, there were in a previous draft, which are not in this one. And I think that's OK, because again, we went at a pretty high level with this policy. But I do have a staff direction that looks more toward the implementation going forward. I work closely with Director Kotke and, and Mr. Koster to write this, um, along with many of the stakeholders that commented, uh, particularly recently, the AARP, um, the Downtown Council, and some folks from the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee. Um, and so this was actually a theme that emerged from all of those conversations, which was making sure people are really excited about this and want to make sure to be involved as they have been so much in the development and in its implementation. So this is a staff direction that is in front of everyone, um, which is um, to direct staff to return to our committee by the end of this year and then again around this time next year after engaging with stakeholders to report on the implementation of our complete streets policy, including updates on multimodal measurement tools, traffic signal policies and practices, curbside use policy, 
And then with a little shorter timeline, um, by the end of August of this year, with recommended approaches to developing greening plans or policies for the city of Minneapolis. And that last one has a little shorter timeline because actually it's a more significant um, piece. And I think that will give us time to really understand what that commitment looks like. And um, one, one um, option, for example, would be to really think about that as part of our comprehensive plan update. And I think all of these things were already happening. They were, again, in a previous um, draft of the Complete Streets policy. Um, and these will be on different timelines. So the idea isn't that you would have these all done by the end of this year or by this time next year, but just that we would uh, be getting these um, periodic report backs on our implementation um, progress. So uh, again, I'm really thankful for all of the time that staff has put into this. It's a big deal, and it took a lot of work to build consensus around this language. Uh, and I think this is a really exciting moment for our city. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Glidden. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, this, this is really exciting, especially, you know, I've, I've been here um, through the, um, not the beginning stages, but the end stages of adopting the, um, I always forget exactly what it's called, but the Access Minneapolis uh, Tenure Transportation Plan. So I think this is, you know, exciting to see this as we are probably about to embark on how do we update that plan and use this as an overlay uh, for that. Um, I know that there has been a lot of conversation and a lot of engagement with stakeholders to make sure that we're really feeling that we're aligned and working together in moving forward a complete streets policy. So I really appreciate there was a lot of work there. I actually had a question, um, which is, do you think that this policy will, it's a little bit more about what do you think will be the implications of this policy on some of the things that are traditional um, ways that we choose projects and, and things like this, for example, uh, having this uh, policy, do you think this will have an impact on how projects are selected and forwarded for consideration by the Capital Long Range Improvement Committee and, you know, other things kind of through that process? And I just say that because of the emphasis on the pedestrian piece as your kind of biggest building block and then kind of moving forward from there. And I was just curious how you thought this might start playing out, or is that something you'll discover as you start going through those processes that are part of the traditional work of public works? Mr. Chair, Councilmember Glidden, that's something we're currently evaluating, so I don't have an exact mm -hmm. answer for you on that element. But as, as we mentioned, this is something that does carry forth for all elements of our, from programming through uh, construction, operation, maintenance. So that's something we will be looking at, but I do not have an answer for you right now. Okay. Well, I appreciate that, and I just really kind of wanted to maybe just say I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how this will continue to play out. I know that the pedestrian issues are really uh, getting more and more attention, uh, you know, just even watching the news about accidents in St. Paul and Minneapolis and things like that, and so I do remain just interested, and in, I think we're seeing a lot of change in how we're approaching street work. Um, I just, I even look to uh, uh, projects in my own ward. We have this big project we're working on in cooperation with Hennepin County, about 46th Street being one example. So I, I feel like I see a lot of change uh, starting to, to happen in how we approach how do streets best operate for all users of those, uh, of those modes. And I just look forward to kind of seeing how this continues to influence that work, so. Thank you. Councilmember Palmisano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I echo what Council Vice President Clinton, uh, Glidden said. Um, in terms of stakeholder <coughs> engagement, one of the many endorsements received for this policy, as Councilmember Bender mentions, was from the AARP. And it's consistent with our designation effort this year as an AARP age-friendly community. Um, it, it also promises that we deliberately seek input from older Minneapolitans in aspects, in all aspects, actually, it says, of planning and implementation. Um, I was surprised to find out, as we were looking through and considering this complete streets policy, that there are over 46,000 AARP members in Minneapolis alone. Um, and is there a way, it's just my question is, is there a way to institutionalize their involvement and engagement in this process beyond the work we already do with Bicycle Advisory Committee, the Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Um, one thought I had was perhaps using the newly revamped Minneapolis Advisory Committee on Aging 
is another resource for stakeholder engagement um, that would be a lens toward working with older Minneapolitans. And I just offer it as a question. Correct. Staff can address it. Mr. Chair, Councilmember Palmasano. You are correct. Typically, uh, Public Works does report on projects to the Bicycle Advisory Committee and the Pedestrian Advisory Committee. And as staff, we have been having ongoing conversations with the Neighborhood and Community Relations staff, which does oversee the Advisory Committee on Aging and the Advisory Committee on People with Disabilities. And we have been having ongoing conversations with their staff as how those advisory committees can be integrated and how we can most effectively uh, include them as part of our outreach on projects. So that's something we are working on and that we have been having conversations with both those advisory committees and staff from uh, neighborhood community relations who oversee those advisory committees as compared to public work staff who oversee the bicycle and pedestrian advisory committees. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think this is a good question that kind of goes back to the discussions we had about developing implementation strategies and the staff direction. Um, so AARP actually and some other stakeholders specifically requested that we create an implementation committee to oversee the impl to implementation of the complete streets policy. This staff direction doesn't go that far and gives staff more flexibility in determining uh, what is the best approach, you know, utilizing our existing um, boards and commissions or if they see that it's appropriate to look toward a new um, body that would really probably be more temporary and um, kind of reflect the kind of engagement that's happened. But I think this is a good question. So it seems maybe a little bit um, time consuming for staff to have to go to four or five different individual boards and commissions with a street layout for each layout we do. Um, but I think that's one question for staff as we look toward the implementation of our complete streets policy is, um, you know, maybe there are some projects that rise to the level of review by multiple boards and commissions, or maybe we ask folks to come to the um, existing committees that are reviewing projects, like a member of the um, dis community, um, advisory committee for people with disabilities and the, and the aging um, committee. Um, so I think there are multiple, all that to say, I think there are multiple options, and I, my hope was that the staff direction would capture um, the work that staff will be doing to, uh, to recommend what would be the best approaches to incorporating all that stakeholder input in specific projects and in the policy work that will need to happen to implement our plan. Mr. Chair, Council Member Bender, I, I do uh, understand your uh, question as it relates to the community engagement and one of the items that we are working on for the Complete Streets Project Delivery Checklist is making sure there is a component that does identify what the community engagement plan or outreach plan would be. So if there are projects specific that require greater engagement or identifying uh, a number of other stakeholders that are important to the successful uh, development and delivery of a project. I think uh, uh, we have recent examples from some of the downtown streets that we have that have much more robust implementation committees and having the project delivery checklist have explicit items that do identify making sure you are outreaching with the correct elected officials and identifying that plan early on in the process so there is transparency on the roles and how the outreach is performed is one of, the, I, I think, the, the key outcomes of the complete streets is making sure there is that touch point and so that's identified early on. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, I suppose there's elements of, you know, un concepts of universal design, which are, you know, a lot of cities are talking about that, that sort of 8 to 80 livable cities. And so you know, anytime we can engage with folks, I don't know if anyone would want to be assigned to the elementary school children group, but... Uh, but in terms of our seniors, I think we have several access points for those mm -hmm. folks. Um, I just want to say that it, it's just an impressive amount of work that you did um, uh, as, as the lead staff person, but all the support staff that really said this is going to be something that touches everything that the department does, but really every department that engages in the physical environment of the city, including CPAD. I mean, this really goes to the heart of that. And I think we took a really good approach. And the approach was on your early recommendation to not have a canvassing, um, sort of prolific, uh, prescriptive document that tried to touch all things for all times, but something that would be really condensed, as Councilmember Bender mentioned, this is four pages that are extremely dense, but the sort of uh, power that, that these four pages have is pretty, pretty instructive. I mean, it will be a, a very centering document that I think will be durable in multiple situations that we can't even contemplate completely as projects roll out and want to be uh, consistent with the themes of this document. Uh, it'll be a strong, uh, I think, uh, compass for a lot of complicated situations to realize 
our built environment and how people move around in the city. So to that end, I really, really applaud the effort and, and don't underestimate these four pages, that's for sure. Um, and so with that, I think I will move this item with the accompanying staff direction. If there's no further comments, Governor Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to note, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but it's Director Cocky's last committee meeting. Yeah. And I just don't want to steal your thunder, mm -hmm. but I do think that this is part of the legacy that of all the millions of things that Director Cocky has left the city um, from giant infrastructure projects to plans and policies, I really think that this is something going forward that's going to make a huge difference. And I just am really thankful for your work on this in particular. Uh, any further conversation? All in favor say aye. 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 Presenting name, we now have an official complete streets policy to submit to full council. So very good. And then on that note, we have exhausted everything on our agenda. There's a few notices for upcoming events, but um, as was already alluded, this this is a sort of a bittersweet one insofar as this is Kaki, Director Kaki's uh, last uh, time at the DS here in committee, where so much of the work gets done. Uh, that interface between what the project people do to get approval. And then the policy conversations, um, you were in the middle of all of those. Um, and then that's a critical pivot point in the public sector. And, and you did it not just ably, but I think nobly, in the sense that you really uh, brought a citizenry to mind for every decision. That's, that's not the easiest thing to do. I mean, you could just sort of deal with the technical, deal with the political, boom, get her done. But uh, every time there is always a, an informed citizen component to your final decision-making processes. And I think that's reflected uh, not just in all the work that's been done, which is uh, notable, but in, in terms of the spirit moving forward. I think that will be an enduring thing that I certainly take to heart. Uh, so thank you for that. Councilmember Blinden. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted the opportunity to say a personal thank you. Gosh, I, I never get emotional now. I'm a little emotional. Um, <laughs> but I just, I really wanted to say thank you to, um, to Steve Kotke. I just, you know, um, Councilmember Wright talked about um, the impact that you've had on the city as a whole, and I just I think that can't be understated. Um, that you have put your your touch, and I say that because um, I just I, I really see you as a very talented department head, someone who was able to lend your direction, but also allow your staff to feel like they really had the responsibility and, and the um, latitude to lead with their own expertise as well and helping them develop as strong leaders so that um, we have felt like there is really, a, I feel like, a, a deep bench in the Public Works Department of people who can be called on, um, who understand their job, but also understand kind of the dynamic of how to work with so many stakeholders and so many interests at play. And I just um, think that uh, I really have enjoyed your leadership. Um, and uh, you will be very, very missed. And, uh, and your impact is not just on, on concrete <laughs> and, and all these things around us, but I think just the, the nature with how we're approaching the importance of all the things that are done within the Public Works Department. and. Uh, Thank you so much. Really enjoyed working with you. Director Kotke. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, committee members, uh, it, I, first off, uh, I agree entirely. We have a, a very talented deep bench in public works. I'm very fortunate to be able to work with some very, very talented people. But uh, I also really want to thank uh, your committee for the all the help and decisions that you've uh, helped us we worked through over the years, and um, it very, very much appreciated. So thank you. Well, with that, um, we are adjourned. <laughs>